Today is the third Sunday after Easter. The epistle is taken from chapter 2 of St. Peter. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims to refrain yourselves from carnal desires which war against the soul, having your conversation good among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by the good works which they shall see in you, glorify God in the day of visitation. Be ye subject therefore to every human creature for God's sake, whether it be to the king as excelling, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of the good. For such is the will of God, that by doing well you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not as making liberty a cloak for malice, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to those of bad temper. For this is things worthy before God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Holy Gospel taken from St. John, chapter 16. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, A little while, and now you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said one to another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me, because and because I go to the Father. They said, Therefore, what is this that he says, A little while? We know not what he speaketh. And Jesus knew that they had a mind to ask him. And he said to them, Of this do you inquire among yourselves, because I said, A little while, and you shall not see me, and again a little while, and you shall see me. Amen, amen, I say to you that you shall lament and weep, but the world shall rejoice. And you shall be made sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has brought forth the child, she remembers no more the anguish for the joy that a man is born into the world. So also you now indeed have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man shall take from him. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. Happy Mother's Day to all the, the glorious mothers out there. And after the Mass, there'll be a Mother's Day banquet. Everyone's welcome with coffee and donuts. Uh, and there'll be a, a, a general catechism for everybody uh, down at the priest's house. And uh, next week, we'll begin the children's catechism. The seminarians will divide the youth uh, accordingly, and they will uh, start teaching the catechism in different places. And that, that will be announced next week. And... Uh, I encourage you to do this. Of course, the catechism should be taught already in your homes. It should be a normal family conversation, and not, not fake, just normal conversation. The faith is everything for us. And, um, but this is also uh, puts them a little bit to the test. They have a seminarian teaching them, and um, maybe perhaps some little quizzes, and nothing heavy, but uh, to know their faith. Also, I'll have available down at the priest's house afterwards, there is, Father Gruner has uh, put out a declaration, which is a, uh, a petition to the Pope to consecrate Russia. To stop fooling around, putting the clown noses on, and praising the Buddhists and Muslims, and, <clears throat> and praising the Jews. Enough of the scandal. Just be Pope. And at least consecrate Russia as Our Lady of Fatima asked him to do. So you can sign your name to this. It's a petition to the Pope. And I will send to Father Gruner, and uh, everyone here should sign it. Because the mess will continue, the degradation, the destruction of the Catholic Church will continue until the Pope finally obeys the Blessed Virgin Mary. And the last five, six Popes, all of them have slapped her in the face turned their back on her and said, we can do it better. But heaven gave us the solution. It's that simple. So this is another petition, and back it up, of course, with prayers. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Mothers need a good example today. And I will give you one. One given to us by the Holy Ghost himself. We are in very similar times as this mother was. This mother lived in a time when there was a one world order being established. The temple had been desecrated. The altars had been smashed. Communion rails removed. They had dancing girls in the temples, 
to the rage of the Maccabee father. And the old patriarch, the Maccabee father, stood up and he said, my and my, Me and my sons, we will not go along with this destruction of the faith. And remember, before Christ, the Jewish religion was the true religion. There was no other. And so Judas, Maccabeus, and his sons, they resisted. And they picked up weapons and they fought. And they fought valiant battles and they defended the true faith. And in the midst of this persecution, of this establishing of a one-world religion and a one-world government, there was a brave mother. And her sons were, all of them, arrested, the whole family. And briefly, I'll give you the account. It's taken from the second book of Maccabees, chapter 7. It came to pass that seven brothers, together with their mother, were arrested and compelled by the king to eat swine's flesh, pork. And God's law forbade eating of pork. Why? Because the pagans often offered pigs to, to sacrifice to their false gods. For which purpose they were tormented with whips and scourges. But one of the sons, who was the eldest, said this, What wouldst thou ask or learn of us? We are ready to die rather than to transgress the laws of God received from our fathers. Then the king, being angry, commanded frying pans and brazen cauldrons to be made hot, which forthwith, being heated, he commanded to cut out the tongue of him that had spoken first. And the skin of his head being drawn off, they chopped off also his hands and feet and the rest of his brothers, and his mother, looking on. Now mothers, you want a good example? Was this, was this mother screaming and cursing God for allowing this to happen to her son? Was she cursing the Catholic faith, or at that time, of course, the Jewish religion? Oh, how terrible this is. How it divides my family. How it brings such inconvenience. Look at this mother. She's looking on. And is she screaming and hollering against God? No. She is encouraging her son, be brave. That is a Catholic mother. And when he was now maimed, his hands and feet chopped off in all parts, he commanded him, being yet alive, to be brought to the fire and to be fried in the fire frying pan. And while he was suffering therein long torments, the rest, together with the mother, the Holy Ghost makes this point, together with the mother, exhorted one another to die manfully. That is a mother. And they said to him, the Lord God, the, 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 the man was saying, the Lord God will look upon the truth and will take pleasure in us as Moses declared in the profession of the canticle, and in his servants, he will be pleased. So when the first was dead, after this manner, they brought the next son to make a laughing stock of him. And when they had pulled off the skin of his head with the, the hair, they asked him if he would eat the pork before he was punished throughout the whole body and every limb. So they gave him a chance to apostatize. But he answered in his own language and said, I will not do it. Wherefore, also in the next place, receive the torments of the first. And when he was at his last gasp, he said, Thou indeed, O most wicked man, destroy us out of this present life. But the king of the world will raise us up, who die for his laws in the resurrection of eternal life. And after that son, the third was made a laughing stock. And he said, these I, he, he said about, about his hands and his feet and his tongue, which were about to be cut off, these I have from heaven, 
but for the laws of God I now despise them, because I hope to receive them again from him. So that the king and, that, and they that were with him wondered at the young man's courage, because he esteemed the torments as nothing. And after he was dead, they tormented the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, Now the mother was to be admired above measure and worthy to be remembered by good men who beheld her seven sons slain in the space of one day and bore it with the great courage for the hope that she had in God. And she bravely exhorted every one of them in her own language being filled with wisdom and joining a man's heart to a woman's thought. She said to them, I know not how you were formed in my womb, for I neither gave you breath, nor soul, nor life, neither did I frame the limbs of every one of you, but the creator of the world that formed the birth of man, and that found out the origin of all, he will restore to you again in his mercy both breath and life. Now you despise your life for the sake of his laws. And now the seventh son. He was the youngest, so he was very dear to the mother. And Antiochus, the king, thinking himself despised, he brought forth the youngest one alive. But he treated him different. He treated him the way the modernists are treating the last sons of the battle of the Catholic faith. Let's make a deal. Bribery. You be silent about the Catholic faith, just, just pay a price of recognition. You won't even have to sign anything. That is the new step to crush the Catholic faith. It's done with a smile and it's done with fancy dinners and wine glasses. And this is what is coaxing, deceiving the leaders of our, of our once dear Society of St. Pius X that used to stand loudly, clearly, strongly opposed to all attack against the Catholic faith. But now they want to shake hands with the enemies of Jesus Christ and the enemies are very smart. It's an old tactic and it works very often. But what did this youngest son do? Did he waver? He assured him with an oath that he would make him a rich and happy man, and if he would turn from the laws of his fathers, he would take him for his friend and furnish him with everything necessary. You need a car? You need seminary buildings? You need money? We'll give it to you, no problem. But when the young man was not moved with these things, the king called the mother. And he counseled her to deal with the young man to save his life. And when the king exhorted her with many words, she promised that she would counsel her son. So bending herself towards her son, mocking the cruel tyrant, she said in her own language, now listen to the last words of the mother. This is her last son. All of them have been killed before her eyes. She at least maybe can have at least one son live. And she could have invented some gooey, gushy, sentimental phrases like, how can you treat me this way? I am your mother. Don't rip up the unity of the family. Think about unity. Think about the good of the family. Think about the good of this and the good of that. But this was a real mother and she's a model for all mothers, especially today when the world has entrenched itself in full warfare to crush the Catholic faith, to rip Jesus Christ the King out of every level of life. Yeah. 
from our governments, our constitutions, from our economic laws, from all our social education of the youth, colleges, universities, and now within the Catholic Church we have the, the glorified triumph of the enemy. And that, that triumph was flaunted with the canonizations of the two popes who brought the devil into the Catholic Church, invited him, gave him a seat, a fancy dinner and red carpet treatment. And to canonize Pope John the 23rd and Pope John Paul II, and soon in the fall, it's just been announced, Pope Paul VI, to canonize these popes is to canonize everything that uncrowns Jesus Christ, everything that mocks Jesus Christ as God, as King, as High Priest. And that's why you Catholics, you few, you, you happy few indeed, imitate the strength of these sons and this mother, and listen to the words of the mother to her son. What strength! What beauty, what virtue, what faith in this woman. My son, have pity upon me that bore thee for nine months in my womb and gave, nursed thee for three years and nourished thee and brought thee up to this age. I beseech thee, my son, look upon heaven and earth and all that is in them and consider that God made them out of nothing and mankind also. So there's no, no illusions about evolution, for sure. They have the faith. She continues, So thou shalt not fear this tormentor, but, but be made a worthy partner with your brothers. Accept death, that in that mercy I may receive thee again with thy brothers. Because all of them know the faith. And we all, we're going to profess it very soon again in the credo. You're going to chant, and I look for the resurrection of the dead. And all these sons, every one of them that was murdered here, they all said, you can kill us, king, tear us to pieces, but we will rise again, complete and whole. That is the, the, the profession of the faith of the resurrection at the end of the world. When you will rise at the age of 30, you will be strong, healthy, forever and ever. Whether it be strong and healthy to burn forever in hell, or strong and healthy to be in heaven. And the resurrected body, like Christ's resurrected body, will be able to fly where you want. You'll be able to play hide and seek, appear and reappear. You'll be able to pass through physical matter as Christ passed through the walls of the upper room and through the womb of his virgin mother at his birth. You will also uh, have the gift of impassibility. You will never stub your toe because you'll always have the, the smarts to avoid stubbing your toe. You'll be able to, uh, you'll never get sick, you'll never get old, you'll always be young and youthful. Everything that the modern world dreams of having, young age forever, <laughs> God will give it to you. Just be faithful to Him now. Keep His laws now. Love Him above all now. And don't compromise the Holy Roman Catholic faith. Never. Even if it means starvation. Even if it means economic relapses for your family. Even if it means death. And it's easy for me to say this on the pulpit. When the crunch comes, who will stay strong? Only those who are humble of heart who put all their trust in the true God and who turn above all to the real Heavenly Mother. She alone will give us the strength in these times. So what happens? While the mother was speaking these words, the young man said, For whom do you stay? I will not obey the commandment of the king. Oh, disobedience. Scripture is promoting disobedience. Yes, when it comes to disobeying men, in order to obey the law of God, yes, that's the right proportion. In our situation now, we must disobey Bishop Fillet and his command to be silent about the agreement with Rome, 
which I was personally commanded to do, and many society priests, Father Pfeiffer, Father Chazal, Father, uh, all of the priests who have been, and Father uh, Thomas Aquinas, two years before they started making these uh, new contacts and deals with Rome, two years before, so that would be 2010, Menzingen, the superiors of the Society of St. then contacted the great, old, venerable Don Thomas Aquinas, the prior of the Benedictine Monastery, who survived two major battles of compromise. One in France with his, his Don Gerard, his superior, and he had to disobey him. I will not go with this agreement with Rome, because it means the destruction of the faith, or at least silencing it. And then also the Diocese of Campos, who made the agreement with Rome, and guess how they advertised it? This is what they're doing now. Bishop Fillet is speaking this way now. He is saying, like Bishop Rufan said, oh, it's no agreement. We don't need to sign anything. It's just a recognition of who we are. And that recognition is the price to be silent about the Catholic faith, silent about the kingship of Jesus Christ over all nations, which Vatican II has ripped off. Vatican II has torn off the crown of Christ the King. That's why we resist it. It attacks Jesus Christ, the true God, the true high priest, the true king. That's why we resist this destruction of the faith. And that's why within the society we resist this movement to the silencing of the faith, which Bishop Fillet sadly, so sadly, is, is blindly rushing into and using all kinds of fuzzy terminology. When somebody asks him point blank, why are you doing this? His answer is, well, you don't understand me. There's nothing clear anymore, and he's speaking like a modernist. The modernist speaks that way, double tongue. You never know what they, you never know what they're saying. Proof. Try to read Pope John Paul II, any of his encyclicals. Just try it. Give it a shot. Try to make any sense of it. Try to read Vatican II. It's full of ambiguity and full of confusion. So this, this is how we must imitate this mother and this son. I will not obey the command of the king, but the commandment of the law which was given us by Moses. In other words, I put God first. But thou that has been the author of all mischief against the Hebrews shall not escape the hand of God. For we suffer this for our sins. And though the Lord our God is angry with us a little while for our chastisement and correction, and maybe that's why tradition in the Catholic Church has undergone such a persecution from within because of our sins. Yet, God will, be, will reconcile again with his servants. But thou, O wicked, and all, of all men, most flagitious, be not lifted up without cause with vain hopes, whilst thou art raging against his servants. For you have not yet escaped the judgment of Almighty God, who sees all things. And so, the young man after saying these words, he concluded, But I, like my brothers, I offer up my life and my body for the laws of our fathers, calling upon God to be speedily merciful to our nation, and that thou, be, by torments and stripes, may confess that he alone is God. But in me and my brothers, the wrath of the Almighty, which has justly been brought upon all our nation, shall cease. And then the chapter concludes. Then the king, being incensed with anger, raged against him more cruelly than all the rest, taking it grievously that he was mocked. So this man also died undefiled, trusting completely in the Lord. And then verse 41, notice how the Holy Ghost crowns this chapter. Last of all, after the sons, the mother also was consumed. She died for the faith. 
So she lived encouraging all her sons to be strong in the faith. And she herself died a martyr, very, very similar to how the Mother of God stood through all the whole scourging, the crowding with thorns, the whole way of the cross. And she was there to encourage her son do the will of the Father. This is God's will. Save these souls, otherwise they'll all go to hell. And the mother was right there. She's the co-redemptrix. She is the co-redeemer. And so, you good mothers, what a model you have in this great mother, this saint of the mother of these sons in the Maccabees. Another very similar mother in the persecutions of the church in the 200s was Saint Sinforana. Saint Sinforana, who also saw her sons uh, martyred before her eyes and herself was put to death for the faith. So what do we learn from such a mother? She told them to be ready to die for the law of God. That means she made sure in her home the law of God was loved. The commandments were kept. That God was truly adored. And that means, of course, daily family rosary, catechism, the having books and magazines available in your home where the kids on a boring rainy day can read, can read the faith, life of the saint, the, the, the teachings of the church, the crisis of the church, the writings of Archbishop Lefebvre. And you want this to be, it should be so normal in your family, the love of the faith, the defense of the faith. And uh, uh, the, the mothers, you are, you are in a way, you are, the, the, the husband is the walls, the, the man is the pillars of the home, he holds the home up, he's the roof. But the, the wife is the, the plants and the carpeting and the, and the niceness and the good food. And the, she's the furnishing. She is the one that backs up her husband. When the husband teaches the faith or has to make a correction on some sons, she's the one that afterwards, you know, binds the wombs and she encourages him. See how your father is looking after your soul. He's not angry with you, but he doesn't want you to grow up and be a useless bum. Wants you to get to heaven. And the mother, by her words, she softens the blows and she brings growth and she brings fruitfulness, she brings life. And the mother touches the heart of her children. How many priests? And I knew an old Monsignor, and he told me this himself. I said, Father Monsignor, when did you think first think of the priesthood? He said, On my mother's knee. How many priests, really, how many priests and saints now in heaven had the faith deeply, deeply instilled in their heart and mind with the help of the Holy Ghost through the good words of the mother and through the, through the manly words and example of the Father. And today all these things are being completely destroyed and we've got to teach our children we are in the last war. This satanic revolution of Vatican II of the One World Order is set, it's pitted to completely make war against Christ the King. There is no peace treaty for them, and there is no peace treaty with us. There never can be. And that's why for Bishop Fulani to be discussing an agreement and wanting it so bad and putting it in the very constitutions of the general chapter statement with six condition, it's a complete surrender to the enemy. But the Catholic children of the truth, we swear no truce with this enemy. There is no peace with these enemies because they are liars, they are deceivers. And how much more proof do we need the kind words of a King Antiochus and all those who sought to uh, make Christ and trip him up he would just compromise the faith and the apostles and all the martyrs down the history of the church. And the Cristeros in Mexico, they, were, they made the peace treaty under obedience to Pope Pius XI. They made the agreement. And did those Freemasons keep their promise of peace 
Absolutely not. They broke it from the very minute after. They shot them all dead that were in the town square. Then they hunted them down for the next 25 years. All the commanders, the generals, the priests, anyone who was associated with the Cristeros were killed. You do not make peace with these enemies of Jesus Christ. We have to imitate the Virgin Mary. How does she show us Eve dialogue with the serpent? Now we know what happened then. Does the Virgin Mary dialogue with the serpent? No. What happens? She takes her foot and by the power of God crushes his head and squishes his brains and his blood out. That's the way you discuss with these enemies of Christ. There can be no peace treaty between them. And this is what all of you should know. Uh, Hugh Akins, who published the book on uh, the Jewish uh, the synagogue of Satan, which all of you men certainly should read. All of you men should certainly read that book because it, it brings up all the papal vision, all the vision of the popes who saw this coming, the good popes. And he put out recently a, a, an exhortation from Bishop Sigurd at Vatican II. He was a friend of Archbishop Lefebvre and Bishop de Castro Mayer, and he presented to the Cardinal what Vatican II should do. And he said Vatican II should expose the, the, the synagogue of Satan for what it is, and, 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 and strengthen the Catholics to do war against this revolution in their families, in society, at the political level, at the social level. This would have been dynamite if this went through, but it was cast to the flames. And uh, he, he speaks that the Catholics cannot compromise the faith. Here is what he says, and I'll wrap it up here. Certain principles have to be strongly inculcated against the minds of Catholics, even in the clergy. Certain principles, again, have to be planted in the minds. First, no compromise is ever permissible. And that's been the story of Catholicism for the last 200 years, is compromising, compromising, compromising. No compromise. Catholics cannot be modern, or up-to-date, or regularized in a pagan world. Secondly, even if the principles are safeguarded, the concessions made to the world can be pernicious to the Catholic cause. Namely, when the con this concession constitutes an invitation to evil for fragile human nature by scandal. In other words, uh, he gives the example. For instance, someone may be able to go frequently to a casino without sinning, but for most people, this frequentation is not possible without sin. So in other words, he's saying, give strong guidelines on, on questions of war, questions of morality, questions of dress, questions of entertainment, and he would certainly have brought up internet, video, and all that. And then thirdly, If the lack of compromise irritates our adversaries, that we don't want to make peace with these enemies of Christ, this is not necessarily an evil. On the contrary, this could be a great good. This is what our Lord did. A war is not waged and victory is not won without a painful conflict. And so in other words, Catholics have to be trained to not be compromisers, but to validly defend and know the church's teaching on questions of church and state, on questions of true liberty and false liberty, on questions of morality. The Catholics got to be clear, but it's all been confusion for many Catholics for the past 50 years. That's why Archbishop Lefebvre, he defended clearly the faith. And he said many times, we cannot make a group agreement with these, these enemies of Jesus Christ because they want to crush Catholic tradition. So let me just close with the words of Archbishop Lefebvre himself. Also, he said in 1988, when the question is raised as to when there will be an agreement with Rome, 
what will this agreement be? My answer is simple. When Rome again crowns our Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot agree with those who dethrone our Lord. The day they give the crown back to our Lord as King of peoples and nations, it is not we they will join, but the Catholic Church in which we stand. That's the real agreement, is for Rome to come back to the faith of tradition. And it won't happen until enough rosaries are said and the Virgin Mary begged, and we ourselves reform our lives, root out, root out what offends God in us, keep frequent confession, frequent communion, daily rosary, and fight. Know the faith, love the faith. So like the Maccabees and this glorious mother, we might persevere to the end. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us, Father, Son, the Holy Ghost.